And you, you write about the death of Cranmer as being a propaganda disaster for, for Mary. I mean, do you think that has done a great deal to shape later historical views? Yeah, well, I mean, the, I, I don't, it's not just the death of Cranmer. Uh, Ridley and Latimer died magnificently, mm. and Fox wrote up their deaths in ways that mm. caught the imagination. But Cranmer legally should not have been burnt. He recanted six times, and as a, a penitent heretic, he might, given the, the fact that he was the arch heresiarch, you know, that he'd led the country into heresy, it, it would have been intelligible if he'd been put under house arrests, uh, you know, say in one of the bishop's houses, for the rest of his life. But he shouldn't have been executed. The determination to execute him seems to have been the Queen's, and for a very understandable reason. He's the man who divorced her parents. He ruined her life, in a way. And he'd been the key figure in the whole Reformation. But this is the one instance in which he was probably at odds with Cardinal Poole, who's her chief religious advisor. Poole clearly thought that Cranmer was far more valuable, alive and penitent, than dead and defiant. And it was the determination to burn Cranmer, despite his recantations, that gave Cranmer the courage to die well. Up till then, you know, he'd been a sort of lachrymose penitent saying, you know, he was going to be a good Catholic now. And he was given a pulpit in the university church in order to say, you know, what a bad man I've been and how I deserve to die. And at the very last minute, he seems to have substituted what he was going to say for a defiance, a you know, reaffirmation that the Pope was Antichrist and that the Christ was not present in the Mass. And then he rushed to the fire before he could, you know, recant again. He didn't trust his own stability. But later the same year, Poole stage-managed an almost equally spectacular recantation. Sir John Cheek, who'd been the tutor of Edward VI and who was a major leadership figure for the Protestant exiles abroad, the regime had him kidnapped and brought back to England. And he's, you know, he's one of the ideologues of Protestantism. He's a theorist, deeply committed Protestant. But he makes a spectacular public recantation at court, and then sits alongside the Bishop of London when heretics are being tried for the rest of his life. He didn't live much longer. He only lived into the next year. But that was tremendous trophy mm. conversion. God alone knows whether it was sincere. It probably wasn't. He was doing it to save his life and his property for his family. But it struck a tremendous blow at Protestant confidence, and that's what should have happened with Grandma. As far as the, the treatment of, of women is concerned, I mean, a sizable minority of those burnt were women. And I wondered if you detected a d different attitudes at play, or was it simply that women were not in, in the sort of positions where they, they found themselves as regularly uh, in line for, um, for prosecution? Well, there were 56 women burnt. 59 died. Some of them died in jail. And that's quite a high proportion of the 284 they vary in status. Nobody has high status as Anne Askew in Edward's reign uh, is executed for heresy. A lot of them are poor women, many of them illiterate. And on the one hand, even some of the, those engaged in the heresy hunt thought that there was a tendency to target the defenseless. One of Bishop Bonner's Pursue them. actually wrote him a letter saying, you know, the reason this is not going down very well in Essex is that we know there are a lot of well-to-do gentry, hidden Protestants. Nobody's arresting them, but they are arresting, you know, women and poor men, and the, the common people think this is unfair. But there's also a sense in which nobody gave a toss about poor poor, defenseless, ignorant women, you know, yeah. people shrug their shoulders and say, well, these are people of no account. It's obvious in many of the trials that the authorities were extremely reluctant to press heresy cases against people who couldn't give a coherent account of why they thought things were, why, why they thought Catholic doctrine was wrong. You, you, had, you had a very nice phrase, which I, I copied down, that the smoke from the fires of Smithfield <laughs> is in all our eyes, and Smithfield being one of the places where the executions took place. Yeah. And 
you also mentioned, I think, that when you told people what you were working on, some people reacted, you know, after several centuries with, <laughs> with this taste still. And I wondered if you could say something finally about the mark that those years have left on the English imagination and whether you think we can get the, the smoke of the fires out of our eyes. Not so much in the 16th century, but in subsequent centuries, because of the history of the Stuart monarchy and the fact that they all married Catholics and that eventually a Stuart monarch is ousted for being a Catholic, uh, things like Guy Fawkes Day, burnt into, literally burnt mm. into the Protestant imagination in England, mm. is the sense that Catholicism is alien, cruel, repellent. Mm. And the burnings under Mary had become iconic proof of that, so that even, you know, I, talking to fellow historians, people whose views one respects, you can see that they very often have a sort of impressionistic, intuitive, visceral reaction. And when you offer to look closely at the... You see, we're looking at a, a, a campaign here which did involve the, the death by torture of men and women for religious opinions. To sit down and say, let's look at it and see if it was working, yes. if it made political sense. People feel that there is something immoral about suggesting that persecution works because we're all so horrified by the thought of you know religious violence uh, of of torture and if if you for example suggest that um, well some of the people involved in in the campaign were actually compassionate men who were trying to do their best and would have let the victims off if they could it, it's like saying well Goebbels was very nice to his pets you mm. know it, you you look as if you're colluding yes. with tyranny. So it's, it, the whole thing is still very morally and emotionally charged, and that makes it very difficult to see uh, the issue coolly and calmly and to, to make some sort of balanced assessment of what was going on and whether it was working.